welcome to Nuked Radio. Today is Thursday, April 5th. This is episode 19. And how appropriate is it that during Doom Week on Nuked Radio, we have Matt Stein with us today. But before we get to him, I need to read you guys a list. Because uh, I found something on the NRC website last night that was very concerning. And if you missed the forecast... I'm going to just read this to you quickly. Uh, Rosemont Nuke Plant in Minnesota found some pressure transmitters that have an out-of-tolerance condition. And the NRC concluded that a substantial safety hazard exists because of this problem. And it's recommended that the following nuke plants all check these parts in their plants immediately. And there's 25 plants, Calvert Cliffs, Millstone, Hope Creek, Salem, Catawba, Crystal River, Farley, Oconee, St. Lucie, Vogtel, Watts Bar, Braidwood, Davis Bessie, Cook, LaSalle, Point Beach, Arkansas Nuclear One, Comanche Peak, Diablo Canyon, Palo Verde, San Onofre, South Texas Project, Waterford and Wolf Creek. So if you guys live around any of the above mentioned plants, I would contact your local news today and have them do a story on this because this is a significant safety concern. So with me today is Jules. Hello. Hi, Jules. Hi, Christina. And Matt Stein, who is the author of When Technology Fails, a manual for self-reliance, sustainability, and surviving the long emergency. He wrote another book, too, When Disaster Strikes, a Comprehensive Guide for Emergency Planning and Crisis Survival. And I didn't even know about these two books. What I wanted to talk to him about is an article he wrote called 400 Chernobyls, Solar Flares, EMP, and Nuclear Armageddon. Matt is an engineer, a designer, and green builder. He has a degree in mechanical engineering from MIT. He's also designed consumer water filtration devices, solar PV roofing panels, medical bacteriological filters, emergency chemical drench systems, computer disk drives, portable fiberglass buildings, and he owns and operates Stein Design and Construction, providing product design services, engineering analysis, and green building. And he's been on numerous radio and television programs such as Fox News, MSNBC, Coast to Coast AM, and he's also a guest columnist for the Huffington Post. And we are very fortunate to have him on the show today. Welcome to Nuked Radio, Matt. Oh, thank you so much for having me on today. I had no idea what a popular guy you were. And I talked yeah, about I, the 400 Chernobyl's myself. article. Yeah. Yeah, I call myself the optimistic doomer sometimes. I'm, uh, you know, it's, people sometimes say, well, how can you write these books and these articles like The Perfect Storm, Six Trends Converging on Collapse, or 400 Chernobyl, When Technology Fails, When Disaster Strikes, but yet I'm you know, actually a fairly smiling guy. So it's like, you know, what gives? <laughs> well, facing our fears head on is very empowering when we know what to expect. And you were actually inspired way back in 1997, long before Y2K and 9-11 and the economic collapse in 2008. So could you tell us exactly what happened? Yeah, it was, it was um, I never considered myself a survivalist, but uh, though I must admit for decades I've had concerns about world trends and where the world's headed. But in 1997, roughly Thanksgiving, I was meditating and praying, which was my usual way of starting the day. I've had, a, in those days, 20-year practice, now it's more like 30 years. Not Nothing fanatic, just kind of a, a nice, pleasant way to start my day. And occasionally, I'd, I'd, get, I'd ask for and receive help on difficult engineering design problems when I was banging my head against the wall and couldn't figure out a good, a good solution. But on this day, I just made a generic request for guidance and inspiration, and I got a bomb dropped in my lap. It's kind of like the guys on the other side must have been laughing, like, did he say it? Did he say it? Oh, he said it. He said it. All right. So anyway, what I got, I just asked for guidance, and I all of a sudden, I got this pictorial 
storyboard outline, call it a vision, dumped into my head instantaneously, like a like an artist will outline scenes in a play or in a movie with on a storyboard and with pictures outlining scenes and what was going on. And I got this dumped into my head outlining a mammoth book project to help people cope with massive failures in technology somewhere in our not too distant future. My first thought was uh, no effing way. I mean, I don't know this stuff. I can't possibly do this. And Jesus calls it the still small voice. That little voice in my head said, well, nobody knows it all. And it assured me that I had the skills and talents and that I would get the inner help and the outer help if I chose to take the assignment on, meaning that with my dogged determination and MIT background, and, and I would dig up the, the materials and the experts I needed to fill in the holes, plus I'd get the inspiration and intuitional guidance to direct me when I was, so that I'd keep, keep on track and go in the right direction as I was writing. And I didn't just jump right up and say, well, God talked to me today and I'm going to write this book to help people cope with these really tough times. It took me about a year to decide that maybe it was a good idea and I could actually do it. I ran the uh, idea by Howard Rheingold, who'd done the whole Earth Catalog after Stuart Brand in the 90s. And I ran it by some other friends. They told me how to write proposals. And then the second year, we spent like writing sample chapters and a proposal and getting a publisher to sign a contract and give me a modest advance. And then the third year, I, I uh, really bit the bullet and, and worked like 70 hours a week and uh, racked up the credit cards, put my engineering business mostly on home, hired artists and bought, you know, nine thousand ten thousand dollars in research materials and and wrote the book and, and it came out in uh, roughly thanksgiving of 2000 almost three years to the day after i got the inspiration with the everything that's going on right now can you give us a, a rundown maybe what's on the the top of your list of possible disaster scenarios that we might be facing in my mind there's sort of two i mean well there's a multitude but I'd say that the 400 Chernobyls, and uh, you can go to my website, wentechfails.com, or just Google it. It's all over the Internet, and, and you can get a lot of details on that. We'll talk about that a lot. That both the perfect storm, six trends converging on collapse, and 400 Chernobyls are kind of like the two main threats I see that are, that are really big there. So in a nutshell, the 400 Chernobyl says that uh, every... Every so often, our, our planet gets bombarded with an extreme solar storm. They're called uh, the sun kind of burps and launches this like massive mass of, of sun stuff. It's a highly charged plasma, and, and when it hits the atmosphere of the Earth, then it causes these huge geomagnetic influences on the Earth. So we see them as northern lights. So, for instance, uh, about a month ago, they reported amazing northern lights. You know, the sky was lit up like brilliant uh, fluorescent green, is, you know, even in like Lake Michigan and Chicago areas and stuff. And, and it was kind of cool and, and no big deal. It disrupted some communications. They had to reroute some flights over the North Pole. So in the last 100, 150 years, we've had about 100 really pretty strong, significant geomagnetic storms like that. It, it's called a coronal mass ejection that the sun launches out. And, most of the time, these happen often, but most of the time they don't hit our planet. Most of the time they just fall off in space. Problem is that when you get a real big mother of a ge geomagnetic storm, like the last really giant one, extreme one, happened in 1921. And there was another one just 60 years before that in 1859 from the Carrington event. So the problem is that our modern electric grid and our nuclear power plants and the, the internet and everything that makes our world run now with a, a planet of seven billion people highly interconnected, this massive machine to keep all these people running, none of that stuff was around the last time we had a, a really big daddy of a, a geomagnetic storm. So if that storm were to hit today, the 1921 storm, then all hell would break loose. And, uh, I hear the music, so I understand we're going to have to continue after that. But, but that storm today would be if we if we don't prepare for it, it will be a game over situation. Excellent information. We'll be back in just a moment with Nuked Radio. And we are back with Matt Stein. You know, Michio Kaku has been warning about the threat of a solar uh, storm 
for a couple of years now, and I came across a document written by the California Utilities Commission in early 2011 that they sent to all the nuke plants in their state saying that uh, there was a, a risk of possible transformer damage from a large sun event and that the, the most important transformers that we have are the ones that are attached to nuke plants. So, Matt, can you um, break it down for us, the, the different types of solar storm or solar events that okay. could interfere with our grid? Well, let's talk about the big granddaddy event because these happen naturally recurring. And last one was 90 years ago. Before that was only 60 years earlier. So however you look at it, we're basically due, possibly even overdue, for another one. So it, this could be... And solar maximums happen every 11 years when the sun flips its poles, and we're coming up on a maximum around the end of 2012, early in 2013. And now these, these coronal mass ejections and super solar storms can happen any point in the, the solar period, you know, in, in the uh, cycle, but it, they tend to be more towards the maximums that they're coming up on. So there's concern that this could be a really big one this year. It's kind of like a crap shot. You never really know until it happens. But Say we had a giant solar storm, like you went, the one that happened in 1921, instead of northern lights just down in Chicago or Vermont, well, it lit up this nighttime sky, blood red and orange in Haiti and Hawaii, and from, it's from the South Pole as far north as Samoa. So except for the very deep central tropical zones of the world, the nighttime sky was lit up with an incredible light show. So if you go out and see that one of these days, and then the grid is down and the grid stays down, Problem is, see, when you get this huge geomagnetic storm, it, it's like we have over 100,000 miles of high voltage lines in the United States grid alone. And those act like a big antenna. And so when you have this geomagnetic storm, then you have a huge amount of energy that all of a sudden gets picked up by our power lines acting like antennas. And when these things hit these, they have at the end of each power line at a, at a station, they have a, what's called an extra high voltage transformer. These, are, these were just invented around the late 60s and 70s. And we upgraded the grid with them throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And so these things are really, really sensitive. They're like 500,000 volts uh, they're operating at. And when you get this power lines acting like a big antenna, then they get huge spikes in both voltage and current that go through these transformers and they screw up the transformers and cause them to burn out. Now, when people say, well, so what if you burn out a few transformers and you go down to the hardware store, you buy another one. It's like, wrong. These transformers are custom made. They take, right now, there's a three-year waiting list. It used to be a one-year waiting list, but because China and India have been ramping up their power so much in the last decade, there's a three-year waiting list to get a single one made. They're tens of millions of dollars each and they're 300 tons each, and they require shutting down a freeway to deliver them. So now we're looking at, with the, with the intense scientific modeling looked at in this, in this uh, problem, they, they commissioned the modeling at Meditech Corporation, done under the auspices of Oak Ridge National Labs, and it was double-checked by Sandia National Labs and Los Alamos National Labs. So these are top guys doing this. They figured that if a storm the size of 1921, which is 50% smaller, than the 1859 storm. If one in 1921 happened, it would cook something like 365 of these big transformers. Now, in 2003 in South Africa, they had a big geomagnetic storm that wasn't as intense as the one in 1989 that blacked out power in North America to 6 million people for nine hours. But the one in South Africa cooked 14 power transformers. And what did 14 transformers do to the country? Well, it screwed up their grid for over a year. And they do rolling blackouts throughout the entire country because, you know, they can handle two or three of these going down with spares and, and backup stuff. But when 14 went down, the only way they could compensate is by turning off power in large parts of the country for a significant part of every day. Now, imagine trying to do work when you might have your shopping mall, your air conditioners down, your refrigerators down for eight or nine hours a day every single day of the week, and you never know when it's going to happen. Now... Instead of 14 going down, you're talking 365 going down. You're talking three to five years, maybe 10 years to rebuild and recover from that. So what happens in the meantime? You're talking grid down over large parts of the country from months to years. Now, switch over. Why would we have nuclear power problems? Okay, 
Let's talk about nuclear power plants. Now we're understanding a super solar storm that happens regularly on geological terms, you know, and not that far apart, every 75 years on the average, we think, you know, not that big apart. We're due for one. So what happens to our power plants? Well, nuclear power plants are designed so that when the grid goes down, when there's a huge grid anomaly, they automatically disconnect from the grid and go to emergency shutdown mode. So what does that mean? Well, it's not like flipping a switch when you turn off a nuclear power plant. You've got like millions and millions of watts of power going through there, lots of heat. You turn off the switch and they start slowly shutting down that reaction. It keeps going even when you flip the switch. It's not like a light switch. So the nuclear power plant needs to keep those reactor cores cool for the next three to five years after they start shutting down. And, the, you know, for, certainly for the next day or two, they're extremely hot. And if they lose cooling for just 15 minutes or half an hour, then they melt down critically. So, for instance, Three Mile Island had a 15-minute cooling anomaly, and it caused a partial core meltdown. And in Fukushima, what happened is now when the earthquake hit Fukushima, According to the Japanese authorities, the official, the official line is that the earthquake did not directly cause any failures in the nuclear power plant. What it did was it caused the grid to collapse locally. Then the power plant started disconnecting and shutting down. And then 20 minutes later, the tsunami came along and it wiped out the backup battery banks and backup diesel generators that provided energy to keep the cooling system going when the grid went down. So it was the backup cooling system failure that caused the Fukushima disaster to happen. Now, fast forward, we've got a big solar storm, 300 plus, maybe 200, whatever, a large number of these transformers go down, which means most of the highly densely populated of the area, countries of the country, areas of the country which have the nuclear power plants will have grid failure long term. You have long term grid failure, well these power plants are are mandating to keep at least a week's worth of fuel on hand. And several nuclear operators have called me up and said, well, I talked about the week. They said, well, we got a month. Okay, so say you got a month's worth of fuel on hand, or maybe a week. Now, you got long-term grid failure. It's like 100 Katrinas happening all over the country at once. No oil refineries are pumping gas, are refining. No gas stations are pumping gas. Internet has collapsed. Government has collapsed. Stock market has collapsed. The military is dysfunctional because they require the grid and they require all of these things. Can you imagine that diesel fuel trucks are going to show up like clockwork at all of the world, all of the countries, 104 of the world's 440 roughly nuclear power plants, to make sure that they keep going when there's massive chaos and confusion and grid collapse all over? Chances are slim. So somewhere between one week to one month after the long-term grid failure, you're going to start seeing Chernobyl-like events and Fukushima-like events happening all over the country, 104 nuclear power plants, a large number of them, perhaps all of them, will go critical in that situation. Now, there's a good news, bad news story here, in that for just roughly the price of a single B-2 bomber, that's two billion bucks, that they've already designed the devices to protect these massive transformers from frying in a situation, an electromagnetic situation like an EMP, electromagnetic pulse from a terrorist event, or a solar storm. So for a billion bucks, we could prevent the grid from collapse. Now, we'll never prevent all bad things from happening, but we can prevent the worst things from happening. And for another billion bucks, we could provide a year's worth of fuel and backup parts and EMP hardened and, and uh, geomagnetic hardened containers at every nuclear power plant to at least improve our chances that these plants will survive without critical failure in a long-term grid down situation it's really important that people remember too that if our grid goes down and you lose the internet and which is a very likely scenario um you need to have books and manuals like yeah. when technology Real alternative radio we are oriontalkradio.com And we are back with Matt Stein. Matt, break down the uh, the solar doom for us, and and can you explain to us about EMPs and what we could expect to happen in the first few days after the grid goes down? Okay, well, when the grid goes down, 
Um, you, you need to consider very quickly, make some good decisions about what to do. Because 37% of all Americans live within 50 miles of a nuclear reactor. And so in the very short, if it's a long-term grid failure, then things are going to degrade day after day, week after week after week. And it's going to get worse for months before it starts to get better. You see, in the old days, there used to be warehouses in each city with like a month's worth of food on hand. Now everything's just in time delivery. It depends totally upon the internet and on careful coordination. So you, you have at most about a three day supply of critical food and items in, in each city at a time. So when the grid goes down, it's pretty much what you have. I mean, I live in Truckee, California, which is where the Donner Party had their famous barbecue about 150 years ago where Aunt May got popped in the pot when they had a severe winter. So whenever there's a really big storm and the tourists are in town, it's Lake Tahoe area, then uh, everyone freaks out. And I call it the Donner Syndrome. They all run to the store and like, if they hear that the roads are closed, there's a big storm that might be closed for trucks for, for a, you know days perhaps in Highway 80 at Donner Summit, they run to the store and those shelves are like wiped clean in three hours time if it's a big you know, tourist season day. So that's exactly what you're going to see. So if you have my book, When Technology Fails, which is the massive how do you survive like things falling apart and how do you live green and clean and healthy while things are still working. That book is, will if you have that, or my new book, When Disaster Strikes, which is more of a prepping guide, it's sort of a prepper's Bible and handbook, prepping and survival without the green and, and the old fashioned technologies and all of that. But the new book has a whole chapter on the the unthinkable surviving a nuclear catastrophe, as well as a chapter on solar storms and EMPs. So these are topics that are not covered by when does that, when technology fails, the older, more encyclopedic book. So you know, you might one the new book's perfect for your go bag, and the big book is perfect for your bookshelf. And and you know, if things really fall apart, well, you better have the big book with you too. But okay, let's get back to the subject. So when Katrina hit, three hours after everything goes down the cell phone relay towers start losing power and start having problems. Three days after it goes down, the landlines have lost their backup power supply to keep the telephones going. Instantly after things go down, the gas stations stop pumping, the cash registers stop pumping, the cash machines stop working, you can't access money, you can't buy things. You know, in the old days, when I was a kid working in a ski shop, when the power went out, we just took out our hand crank and you ran the register with that. Well, nowadays, the register's locked shut, doesn't move, nothing's happening. You can't run a credit card or money machine card, nothing. You know, you're, you're screwed, okay? So if you live within 50 miles of that nuclear power plant, think in your mind the clock is ticking. Do they have a week's worth of fuel on hand? Do they have a month's worth of fuel on hand? If this was... A, a geomagnetic, a, an electromagnetic event from a terrorist EMP, meaning that somebody got a hold of a nuke, blew it off, say 50 miles, 100 miles, 25 to 125 miles above the surface of the Earth, causing an electromagnetic pulse. That electromagnetic pulse is not nearly as widespread an influence as the solar storm is. So it's not going to take down the world grid by any way, shape, or form like the solar storm will tend to do. But that electromagnetic pulse is far more damaging locally to electronics. Now, there's a lot of fallacies out there. There's thoughts that like an electromagnetic pulse, all my electronics instantly in America stops. Well, probably not the case. For most terrorist type electromagnetic pulses, you're going to have like a, a smaller device, it'd be like a 500 mile radius, a pretty big nuke, like, you know, they bought one for, on the black market from one of the failed states of the Soviet Union, more like a 1,500 mile radius. So small radius nuke, uh, terrorist device, Scud missile bought on the black market, launched off a freighter off the, you know, junk freighter off the East Coast, that then sunk after they launched the missile. What would that do? Well, that will probably cook the New York Stock Exchange, Washington, D.C., the entire Northeast, if that's where they launched the attack. It would fry all of the industrial electronics that is connected by lots of runs of, of wire. Now, people think all the cars will stop. Well, actually, in EMP testing, it turns out that cars are fairly robust, even modern cars. And so if, you, if you're driving down the car and some terrorist wants an EMP nuke, and it's a normal EMP, not an EMP optimized, I'll go into that in a minute, but they just bought some nuke or they hired somebody to build a small nuke and they, they launched a Scud missile, 
Well, about eight out of nine cars running down the road will still work, though. They'll have funny things like the radio may not work, the lights may not work, the clock may not work, but, you know, they'll still start, it will still run. One out of those eight cars will stop instantly and won't be able to restart. Most of the cars are sitting in, in the driveway, not, not running at the time of the EMP. They'll be okay. They might have some minor anomalies, but they'll still start to work. Now, the problem is that the electronics, digital electronics, is connected by large runs of wire. Those things are going to pretty much 100% fit. Well, what does that mean? We have things called digital control systems, DCS, SCADIS, remote sensing control and data acquisition systems, and PLCs, programmable logic controllers. They all got a bunch of microchips on them. But when an EMP goes off, it, it generates, it's like rubbing your feet on the carpet and touching your, opening up your computer and putting your finger in there and sparking all the little chips inside the computer. Chances are you're going to fry one of those things. So when you have an EMP go off, all of our critical industrial control systems, the things that run our nuclear power plants, that run our communication systems, that run our power plants, that run our fuel refineries, that run our, our uh, sewage control systems and our water purification plants, those things are going to fail. So your personal electronics, your iPhone, probably going to be fine. Your car, probably going to be okay. Your radio in your house, probably okay. But the things that are, makes our world run, they're gone. And the problem is that most of the people who could diagnose and fix that stuff manually are dead or retired. And right now, all of the diagnosing and fixing of these complex systems is done with electronics, done with the Internet, done with remote sensing and data acquisition systems. And those systems are pretty much 100% cooked. Not like every piece in them is fried, but enough pieces in them have failed that the system collapses overall. So you're talking... Now, the good news about an EMP is that there's the rest of the country and the rest of the world that come and fix and help out. The bad news about the EMP is that unlike a solar storm, see, the solar storm doesn't cause all this minor electronics and local electronics to fry. The solar storm causes the grid collapse, which causes central service collapses, which causes this cascading failure of everything else. But the solar storm doesn't cause instantaneous failures of things like the control systems that keep our nuclear power plants cooled and functioning and not melting down. Now, EMP happens. Some of those systems are going to fail. Some of them aren't. It's a crap shot. You're not going to know how many are going to fail. You're not going to know how many are going to fail instantly and start melting down just like Fukushima did after the tidal wave. Some of them, probably a significant percentage of the new plants within the area of the EMP, small EMP, you're talking 500 mile diameter, you know, New York City, Boston, Washington, D.C., all in the same circle. Large EMP, you're talking like from Quebec City, Canada, to Dallas, Texas, to Miami, Florida. I mean, that's a really big circle. You're talking cooking much of the, that uh, critical electronics infrastructure within that large circle. Not all of it, but much of it. That's a lot of power plants, nukes to go down at once. Now, what do you do? Well, you certainly have a go bag set up. You have a plan set up. You realize that like Hurricane Katrina, Things got worse and worse and worse day after day, not better. It took a while for things to start getting better because the infrastructure was collapsed locally. You know, no gasoline pumping, no gasoline refining, air conditioning gone, refrigeration gone, food rotting, no food being delivered, uh, you know, phone systems ran out of backup power and down, all of that. So if you're in an area that you've got to get out, you've got to get out sooner rather than later. Now, if you jump the gun and you panic and you leave, and you get out of the city, and you get a few hundred miles away, and the power comes back on a few days later, and you missed a couple days of work, well, you know, hey, you got to practice your go bag stuff, you got to practice evacuation, you got to do a dry run. You lost a couple days of work, hopefully you didn't get fired, everything's okay, go back to work. If, you, if the real stuff hits the fan, and you didn't do this, and you're in the city, then you're in trouble, big trouble, because as days go on, your chances of getting out will decrease. Your chances of local meltdowns will increase. Your chances of chaos and riots increase. Big trouble. We will be back for the last segment in just a moment. Beyond the sea, somewhere. 
Welcome back to Duped Radio for our last segment. Uh, we brought Drew Lamb back on because when I uh, was chatting with him on Facebook yesterday and I told him Matt was going to be on today, he was like, I'm Matt's biggest fan. And will you ask him what he thinks we should do if something happens at Fukushima, like a hydrovolcanic explosion or the spent fuel pool number four collapsing. And I said, why don't we just bring you on and you can ask him. So he's on the line with us too. But I wanted to ask Matt, um, Matt, you live in California. You've been in the path of a lot of this uh, fallout that's been coming over from Japan. When did you first realize how serious the situation was at Fukushima? Well, um, I tell you, I realized it like right off the bat because I, I showed the film The Last Epidemic uh, on the nuclear freeze movement probably 30 times back in the era of around early 1980s. And uh, I had three days before Fukushima, I had finished the last chapter, the first draft of the last chapter of my new book, When Disaster Strikes, called uh, The Unthinkable Surviving a Nuclear Catastrophe. In a week, two weeks earlier, I had finished the next to the last chapter, which is uh, EMP Solar Storms. So I first so realized as soon as Fukushima happened, I knew how serious the situation was. But actually what happened, but the next level of seriousness happened. I was I did about 25 radio interviews in the two weeks after Fukushima. And I was talking about, you know, EMP on one hand and nuclear arm, you know, nu surviving nuclear catastrophe in Fukushima. And somebody came on the radio and he said, well, Mr. Stein, I don't have an MIT degree or not. But, you know, from what you just said about how why Fukushima melted down and the catastrophe there and what you just said, you know, in an earlier part of the show about EMPs and solar storms, he said, Tell me, you know, what would happen in the event of a long-term grid, grid down situation for an EMP or solar storm? And my jaw dropped, and I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> I've got, and here's part of the problem of the world, is all the engineers in the world are like me. We're really focused on our problems and, you know, what we're focused on, and often we just don't step back far enough to draw the, draw the lines from one side of the board to the other side of the board. So it took this guy on the radio show for me to draw the lines between EMP and solar storms and long-term grid failure and Fukushima, Chernobyl-like grid meltdown, you know, grid failure caused meltdowns across the planet. And so, so yes, I was aware of the seriousness of Fukushima, like instantly. I'd just written the chapter, you know, a couple of weeks before that. But, but then connecting the dots between solar storm EMP and nuclear Armageddon, that didn't happen until about two weeks later when, when one of my listeners actually brought up the point and he connected the dots before I did. Well, Drew lives a, a little bit uh, north of you in Oregon. Uh, Drew, you had some questions for Matt? Yeah. Hi, Matt. Hi. Have you tested the environment down there in Truckee? You know, I, I haven't tested it. Um, I've been relying on other people with better instruments than me. And one of the things that I do is I take four capsules of modifilin, or modifilin, M-O-D-I-F-I-L-A-N, which is a kind of like a cracked wall processed kelp. Um, and what it does is, is it's a very bioavailable chelating agent that hel helps your body dump heavy metals. So not only does it provide iodine, you know, clean, safe, non-radioactive iodine and many other trace elements and things that your body needs to be healthy, but it chelates to heavy metals in your body, meaning lead, mercury, or radioactive isotopes. It helps your body dump them. So it was developed by Russian people in the aftermath of Chernobyl to help um, more effectively to help Chernobyl victims dump radioactive heavy metals out of their body. And so every day for the rest of my life provided i have access to it i'm i'm going to keep taking modafinilin just to help take out the stuff out you know that's coming in the atmosphere and i certainly as a precaution i'd recommend you do the same thing now there are other things like um, oh cilantro is known for especially if it's activated with an acidic compound and crack wall chlorella you know there's a number of different agents that help take it out but from what I've found, modafinilin seems to be one of the most effective ones, and that's the one I've settled on for now. Though, you know, and certainly people also talk about taking uh, clays, 
that Aztec clay, you know, will help uh, bond and remove radioactive elements and toxins from the body. So all of those things to help keep your body clean and purging this is a good idea, and, and certainly to have in your grab and go kit in case things get even worse. But you know, it, if the world really falls apart. You know, chances that that will save you, that you've got tons of that on supply are probably pretty slim. So, but in the meantime, it helps me stay healthier and, and, and better and helps my body remediate at least low levels of radiation. Do you have a bug out plan in the event that uh, the situation gets worse at Fukushima, uh, such as the collapse of reactor number four? The cl- I mean, the best bug out plan in that case, as we're talking in the break, is actually moving to the southern hemisphere. And the, right now, I don't know that I have that as a financial option because of the couple of huge financial losses I did in the last decade. Um, but it's, you know, it's not like if you look at the rainfall patterns and where the radiation actually falls coming from Fukushima, it, it can sometimes be heavier in the Midwest and the East Coast than it is in California because. It gets in the upper atmosphere, and if it's a dry period, it'll actually continue over to California and to other parts of the country where it falls as rainfall. So it's it's not like I can, I mean, to really bug out from that collapse means leaving the northern hemisphere. And, uh, and in the meantime, it's, it's you know, I, I'm hopeful that they'll, that if that, fuel pond starts going, then they'll at least do the sarcophagus like they did over uh, Chernobyl, where they dumped you know, tons of earth and then concrete and made the sarcophagus over it. Because according, you guys have been talking to Arnie Gunderson, when you have um, nuclear cores, reactor cores, when they overheat, they're clad in a metal called zirconium, because just you can't just... You can't just put a core with any kind of metal because most metals don't hold up to the radiation levels that the that the cores give out. So zirconium is a metal that's uh, you know I mean nobody has zirconium in anything that they use in their normal daily life. It's an expensive metal, but it holds up to the radiation. Problem is that when zirconium gets really hot, it burns like magnesium fire. So once the cores start overheating and exposed to air then they, they start burning like, like a flare, and it starts burning and so putting this stuff in the atmosphere. And then if you, if you put water on it, then the water dissociates in the zirconium fire into hydrogen and oxygen and makes an explosive gas combination. And uh, according to Gunderson, he felt that it was probably zirk uh, dissociation that caused the hydrogen explosions in Fukushima to begin with. And so the last thing you can do with zirconium fire is spray it with water. It'll, it'll start things exploding and make it worse. So the only thing you can really do is dump tons of concrete and dirt on it or maybe some other chemicals, non-water-based, to try and put it out. So if, if it turns out that they can't encase it with a sarcophagus like Chernobyl and the, and the fuel pond blows, then, yeah, getting on, you know, taking your last dollar and going to the southern hemisphere might be the best bug out you could do. Yeah, the the other problem too is it's not going to be just the spent fuel pool because if that goes, no one is going to be able to stay on the site. They won't be That's able to correct. go near that site. So not only will you lose the ability to keep cooling the plant, you will lose no. all six six reactors, all the six only, fuel pools, the only and the, the yeah. only solution then is a sarcophagus. And what that means is, you know. There's been roughly a million people died long-term from Chernobyl and three million with long-term health effects from Chernobyl, according to the, to the Russian Scientific Society epistemological study. But there was something like 250 people that died short-term from the effects, and pretty much all of the remediation cleanup people either died young or, have, or are crippled and, and uh, you know, dying young at this point in time. And, and you know, with people like in their 40s and 50s who can't do anything are totally screwed health-wise. But you're going to see, you, there was already a number of workers who basically sacrificed their long-term life in the Chernobyl event so far. And if a fuel pond goes up, then I, I just have to believe that they're going to sacrifice that couple hundred people like they did in Chernobyl and rotate them through and do the sarcophagus because otherwise they're going to lose all of Tokyo, they're going to lose all of Japan and certainly we won't be as affected as severely here but it depends on you know how out of control so I just 
I just can't imagine Japan not sacrificing those couple hundred people like Russia did in Chernobyl to, to, to do the sarcophagus. And uh, so I, I honestly think that'll be the situation. So what has me more concerned is the, is the potential for an EMP or a solar storm to cause multiple meltdowns, multiple fuel pond scenarios all over the North Hemisphere. Matt, we really appreciate you coming on today and, and explaining this to us and your your research and your your books and the articles that you've written are um, just so valuable and please check out his website. I'm going to drop it into chat again. Thank you so much for being on the show and thanks Drew and Jules. We will be back tomorrow, same time. You're welcome and everyone do your best to change the world and do your best to be ready for the changes in the world. And thank you so much for having me on today. Good advice. Thanks, Matt. All right. Goodbye. And have a great day. I hope you didn't bum me out too bad. <laughs>